There we go, we've started recording. So as I was saying, I'm Amanda with Community Culture and Tourism with Clearview Township. And today is about uh, Wild About Birding webinar. And it's part of our four week series that Clearview Township has embarked upon with Georgian Bay Wildlife. It's for the month of February and Wild About Winter has been exploring and will continue to explore and educate um, for all of our local residents as well as outdoor enthusiasts uh, about wildlife and birding and what to expect here in winter. It's been a fantastic partnership and especially during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, we've been able to incorporate education while also getting more people outside and learning and exploring. Um, as I mentioned in my email to all of you as participants, um, we have been working on this for the past uh, four weeks, and I certainly encourage you to follow along on Facebook and Instagram with Discover Clearview, as well as to listen weekly to the radio broadcast on 95.1 The Peak FM here in South Georgian Bay, uh, each Friday morning at 6.30 with Andrew, um, as he talks more about uh, the wild and wonderfulness of winter. So just before we get started, a few key uh, Zoom etiquette points. I just want to remind everyone we will keep everybody muted um, and preferably uh, you can choose to have your video turned on or off. Um, but if you're going to make any changes, please do so at this time. Also, just for um, keeping it very easy, if you can change your username, which you do in the top right hand corner of your feature to your full name, that would help if you want to ask any questions in the chat function, then that way we can um, answer those or respond to them um, via email. Um, throughout the presentation, if you do come across anything that you would like to ask, uh, please enter it into the chat function. To access the chat, you'll want to go to the lower portion of your screen. Uh, for some people, you might have to check on the dot, dot, dot under the more button. And then that's where you'll see the chat box. And you can just type your question directly into the chat function. And then I'll capture those questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, we also, uh, don't worry about spelling. Um, don't worry about that at all. Uh, we will also include Andrew Major's uh, email address so that you can reach out directly to him. Like I had mentioned, this webinar will be recorded and the final presentation will be posted on our YouTube channel for Clearview Township. So at this point, let me introduce our guest presenter. Andrew Major was born in Frobisher Bay Northwest Territories and grew up in the countryside of Meaford, Ontario. He currently lives in Clearview Township and brings a wealth of knowledge as a wildlife technician who studied at Sir Sanford Fleming College. Over the past 10 years, he has run educational wildlife tours throughout, through Georgian Bay Wildlife. Andrew has been contracted throughout Canada to conduct bird, aquatic, uh, and fish environmental impact surveys. He is the Birds Canada Ambassador for Simcoe County and has been involved with the Great Backyard Bird Count for several years. In addition to his love and passion for wildlife, Andrew holds an honors degree in classical history from Queen's University and a master's in Roman Late Antiquity Studies from the University of Ottawa. I also just have to say that he and his wife, ha Tanya, have an adorable family, and he's certainly the proud father to two little kids, Scarlett and Arthur. So I will be turning over the hosting co capabilities to Andrew uh, shortly, and he'll go through our presentation. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining, and we will get started. There we go. So go ahead, Andrew, you should be. Okay, can you hear me? Live. Thumbs up, perfect. Should be coming up here in a second. There we go, can you everyone see that? Okay, so thank you, Amanda. My name is Andrew Major, and thank you for everyone for joining us today and uh, being excited for birds. Um, this presentation is about IDing birds and, and increasing your wealth of knowledge on birding, and it's also 
we brought this forward because this weekend is a very special weekend. It's the Great Backyard Bird Count. And this little bird here that you can see, if I'll give you a high five if you can tell me what bird that is, and another high five if you can tell me what song it is. And it sings. And it's ubiquitous with Canada as a hint. Okay. So just a little agenda here. We'll do a little intro into the backyard uh, bird count in, um, in case you don't know what it is. Um, Amanda was kind enough to do a bio on myself. Um, if there's anything there, I'll just touch it up quick. Then I'll talk quickly about the basics of identification to help um, guide your identification skills. And then we'll jump into the sections. So we have three sections. They're color coordinated, uh, green, orange, and red. So the green are birds that we see every day. These are birds that are common in our area. Uh, the orange are birds that are seen less common. So we don't see them every day we would um, chickadees. And then the red are birds we see rarely, but are still common, okay? Then we'll look at a checklist we made for the area. And then I'll talk to you quickly how to participate and enter your data into uh, ebird.org. And then a uh, quick thank you at the end. Okay, so the Great Backyard Bird Count is a, this year is the 24th uh, annual Great Backyard Bird Count. It's a four day event um, that takes place throughout the world for bird enthusiasts of all ages and all experiences. Uh, it helps us uh, get a glimpse into where the birds are right now and helps us understand migration patterns, year to year changes, and um, long term uh, timelines. It's not hard to participate, it's actually quite easy. It's free, which is super. And it's a lot of fun. And I, I find it a little bit competitive, which I think is healthy too. Um, all you have to do is count birds for a minimum of 15 minutes on one or all the days or count as long as you like on every day. And then you submit your findings uh, or a checklist onto ebird.org. And just because it is a backyard bird count, it doesn't mean you have to sit in your backyard all day. You can go for a hike in the bush, you can go find an eco park, you can find a nature preserve, or go for a drive in the backcountry. Um, you have to understand that the, the commitment you're, you're giving here is instrumental for researchers to understand global bird populations. So sharing your findings, um, you're just joining a lot of other people and becoming assistant scientists. Okay. Now, Amanda, like I said, went through who I was. Um, I don't think I need to touch on anything else. I did spend a lot of my youth, uh, we grew up in the countryside, outside Meaford, and I spent a lot of my time outside. Now, I love to believe I chose to be outside, but I think I was booted outside quite a bit with my siblings to, to help my parents out a bit. Um, but I loved it. We had ponds, we had the bush all around us, no neighbors. It was fantastic. Um, that's where I think I honed my passion and appreciation for, for everything that was wild. Um, studied at Queen's University and again at, uh, at Ottawa University. Now, late Tingu studies is just a Roman studies that stretch from 2nd century AD to the 7th century AD. Uh, a little more specialized Roman studies. I just have a bit of a passion for it too. And uh, Latin and Greek as well, languages. And then I went straight into fish and wildlife at Fleming, which is a fantastic school. And I'd recommend to any, anyone who's going to school or thinking of what to do, if they're interested in, in wildlife, it's a great school to go to, okay? Some of the work I've done around Canada uh, involve, um, I did some acoustic tracking for bird and ba uh, bat radar. I've done uh, banding on a little island called Bon Portage Island off the east coast of Nova Scotia. I uh, did some breeding bird work up in Legislative Lake Bird Observatory in northern Alberta. Um, been all over the place. So all the work has been around here, some reptile work, uh, bringing bird uh, surveys as well, uh, owl prowls. So there's been quite a wealth uh, for me. I've been very fortunate to, to, to go around Canada. Um, and yes, I am very happily married and I have two wonderful children that definitely keep me busy. It's very excited to be here though. Okay, now we're just going to talk about the basic identification features. So these four, these four features, I think they're important for everyone to keep at the front of their head whenever they're looking at a bird. You want to remember these, and if you have two birds that are alike, 
but there is a, no, they're not the same bird. These will help you um, identify each one. So we'll do size and shape. So if you look at this bird here, the sharp shin hawk, that's actually my hand right there. We missed uh, this guy out in the uh, Bon Portage um, in the fall, he was migrating. So this shape, small head on the sharp shin hawk, okay? Shape, streamline. These guys are meant to fly. Color pattern, pretty streaky breast, you'll see here, okay? Behavior, um, agile, direct flight. It does a bit of a, a flap glide pattern. It also flies beneath the canopy and surprises songbirds, okay? And habitat, wooded areas. And also outside of fields, you'll see it going high in fields and back underneath into the bush again. And you may see sharp shins in town from time to time. Not as much as you would see a Cooper's hawk. Okay. So going forward, so we're gonna dig right in. We'll start with the green, the birds we see every day. Um, we're gonna talk about a pair of birds that I haven't spoken to a single person who can hardly tell them apart. Um, Let's dig right in. American crow and the common raven. Now, ravens are fairly new to our area, not just yesterday, but a few years. I was 26 before I saw a raven in that area. Um, crows have been here forever. Okay, so let's start with the crow. Large head, bill, broad wings. Okay, raven, heavy bill. If you see this bird sitting on a, on a bale of hay, heavy, heavy bill compared to a crow and much more lankier in its body, and its wings are much longer, okay? Both are black plumage, that's why it makes them difficult to tell them apart. You wanna talk about their, refer to their song, their crow is that ka ka ka, which you all know, we all heard. Now you compare that to the raven, it does all the croaking. That croaking, you'll hear it croaking. Sometimes it'll do a little, this metallic popping. I've heard it once and it's just magical. Crows typically will fly in a straight pattern, uh, almost like, and the wings, the wing movements almost like a, like there are, uh, like they're rowing almost. Now, if you see a bird up high and, and it's doing barrel rolls, that's probably a raven. It's well known for its aerial displays, especially this time of year. You'll see that when the mating season starts kicking on. Uh, crows, you usually see crows in mobs or in murders. A murder is just a, a flock of crows where ravens will be more solitary or in groups of two, okay? Um, one key feature I would really focus on is I use crows as a means to find, finding uh, raptors, like hawks and owls. Crows are infamous for um, mobbing and agitating owls during the day. And I think they're just trying to get their licks in because at nighttime owls turn the, turn the page. So if anything, Ravens are larger, larger bill, and that croaking song versus the ka ka ka. And use, raven, use crows to find owls and hawks. Okay, we'll move along. Ah, some of my favorites here. So this is the diminutive but aggressive black capped chickadee. These guys are one of the, uh, our feeder's most popular birds. Um, you can see the chickadee, black cap, black throat, very distinctive. Uh, the boreal chickadee is a cousin of his. We don't have that down here. It's more on the boreal forest and out west. Um, but chickadees are extremely vigilant. They hang out in groups called banded trees. Um, if you watch, watch them at the bird feeder, they are quick, agile, and always on the watch. Okay? Habitat, wooded areas. Chickadees are pretty much anywhere. Now you have the dark-eyed junco. It's from a sparrow family, so it's sparrow-sized. Uh, as you see, it's slate colored at the top and snowy colored on the bottom. Junkos have been referred to as the snowbird, which is funny because we do have snow buntings in Canada, but junkos are considered snowbirds because they tend to arrive with the, with the first snow of the year. Okay? They do breed up north and then move down, down south. Uh, a key ID feature for junkos, if you see the bird take off from the ground because it feeds dominantly on the ground, look at the tail and look at the side of the tail. On each side of the tail, there'll be two white feathers. That is a distinct feature, ID feature of juncos. And of course, they are a common feeder um, and woodland bird. Now, a couple of cool facts about chickadees. Um, in order to stay warm in the winter, they do fill up on a lot of bird seed. 
So having a lot of um, uh, sunflowers high in oil is good for them. What will they do? They'll fluff up their feathers and bring air in, and then they'll, and that air, cool air will warm up and help insulate the whole body. So they look kind of puffy, cute and puffy. On the other side of it, juncos put on 30% more feathers in the wintertime. So they look kind of beefier in the winter versus the summertime. So they both stay warm. Juncos, since they have the most feathers, they can just hang out in the bush at nighttime. Chickadees have been known to, to dive bomb into a little cavity in a tree and just hang out there for the night to the point where sometimes their tail feathers are bent when they come out. Okay. Uh, one thing about the chickadee too, I want to point out uh, the song. It's, that song is actually considered onomatopoeia. And all that means is that the song is the same as the name. So chickadee, chickadee, right? The Phoebe is a high, high pitch little um, whistle almost. Phoebe, Phoebe. But the chickadee is onomatopoeia, kind of like a whippoorwill, a whippoorwill or a killdeer. And one cool fact about the chickadee dee dee is the dees themselves. The more dees you hear, the more agitated that bird is. So if you're out there uh, feeding it or filling up the feeders, check out how many dees you get. If you're brand new to the yard, they're going to give you a few dees. If you are been there for a while and feeding them, they, they know you, they're accustomed to you, you might get one or two, if at all. Now, if a red-tailed hawk sat down next to them, they're probably going to do about seven, eight dee dee dees. They know that hawk's a threat, kind of, but they're still too small to, for them to catch it. If a saw what owl or a sharp shin hawk happened to sit down on that tree, you're going to hear about 15 to 20 DDDDs. They are extremely agitated and all worked up. They go bananas. So chickadee DD, definitive of the chickadee. Okay. Uh, now these birds are really special. So we have the white-breasted nuthatch, and we have the red-breasted nuthatch. These two, their territories overlap. They're, they're very similar in size. The white-breasted nuthatch is a little bigger than the red-breasted. Um, so facial patterns, the white-breasted, white on the face, neck, underbody, with a gray in the top. Your red-breasted has a beautiful marking on the face, black on the crown, white eye stripe, black right underneath the eye, and then that red rufous color underneath, that red breasted. But now I want to compare the song. You hear that nasal yammering, wee, 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 wee. That's a white breasted nuthatch. Now if you took that nasal yammering and started smoking, you get that yank, yank, yank. That's the red breasted nuthatch, okay? He smokes a pack a day. That's what he sounds like. So that's that separates those two from each other. But what separates this species from say creepers, brown creepers or from uh, woodpeckers is that they can go upside down, down a tree. So what they do, they have a little trick they do. They take one foot out front that braces them. They stick the other out back that holds the bark. And they go up and down, up and down, up and down. Woodpeckers and brown creepers they're incapable of doing that. They use their tails as balance. And they can only face upwards. Okay. And then we've got the woodpeckers. Now, if these guys don't confuse you, I'm not too sure what it does. So we have a downy and a hairy woodpecker. These birds we see every day, especially the downies. They're very common at the feeders. So we'll dig right in. Downies are the, our smallest woodpecker we have in Ontario. And compared to the hairy, which is almost twice the size of a downy. You'll see the red little dots in the back of their heads. Those indicate males. The females are just absent the red dot, but they all look the same. So downies are smaller, hairs are twice the size. Now here's a key feature I think We'll, hopefully it will stay with you. It, uh, it's what I use to identify them. If you take that bill of a downy woodpecker, just the bill, its length is only a quarter the length of the head. Versus the hairy woodpecker, that's two thirds. That, see that bill? It's two thirds the length of the head. So hopefully that will stay with you. Just look at the bill. If it's small and short and shorter than halfway, only a third of the head, downy. If it's longer, almost stretches along the head, that's a hairy. 
Uh, the song of the downy, just a quick kiki 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 kiki. The hairy, you're going to hear that occur, and then tree drumming, a lot of tree drumming. You know, they can do four to ten in a minute. Okay, and these guys, if if that that should separate those two and to separate them from everyone else, they use their tails balance. They they can bounce right around a tree, no problem. Uh, if you're looking for downies in the bush, look for small trees, small branches. Uh, they might even forage near the ground off stems, uh, reeds. Harries don't go near the ground very often. And hairy woodpeckers you'll see along larger, larger trees, larger limbs, larger trunks. And if you're familiar with a pileated woodpecker, um, a hairy woodpecker will follow up where a pileated has been and clean up any of the uh, food that the pileated missed. So if you do follow them around. Okay. And any kind of holes the hairy makes, because they're well known for the cavities, uh, those holes become habitat, nesting habitat for other birds like chickadees and wrens, um, kinglets. Okay. okay. Uh, so we, we got some sparrows here. Song sparrow and a house sparrow. So these birds are sparrows, but they couldn't be any more different. The song sparrow is native to Canada. The house sparrow is an invasive species. It was brought over in the 1800s uh, by the British. Um, probably was a, it was a pretty bird and just naturally escaped. And it's done quite well. It is, it's not as populated as a song sparrow, but it is still everywhere. Uh, song sparrow, if you look at its, uh, the, uh, look at its breast, it is heavy streak breast with a black, large black dot right in the middle. Very distinctive, okay? House sparrow, gray top, black throat, and black lore. Now, lures are these just a little strip of feathers that run from the bill to the eye, okay? There's a few other birds that have distinctive features of, that use the lures to tell them apart, okay? Song sparrow song, I can't really mimic it, but it is quite lovely. Um, usually hear it in the morning or at dusk, and the bird's usually in a middle-sized shrub or bush singing it. House sparrow, just a, some identical metallic chirps you'll hear. Like if you're walking into, you know, home hardware, you're going to hear chirp, 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 chirp. That's probably a house sparrow on the ground, just bugging around. Uh, song sparrows forage on the forage and nest on the ground, where house sparrows will forage anywhere, ground, in the air, anywhere they get food. But they typically nest in boxes or behind signs, on posts or uh, light posts, by matter. Not typical of our, of our uh, new world sparrows. And song sparrows, they're quite common in your backyard, along hedges, gardens, orchards. Uh, they are comfortable around human-modified uh, buildings. House sparrows, they're ubiquitous with concrete jungles. You will not find these birds in forests or grasslands. You might find them on a farm getting some free food from the granaries. Other than that, they're going to be in town looking for a free food. They're kind of like... You know, those kids down at the mall, they're always hanging out at the mall and not sure what to do all day. And you want them to get a job, but they won't get a job. And, but they're always there. You know, that's a house sparrow. They're always going to be by the stores hanging out. Okay. All right. So uh, for a song sparrow too, it helps to practice because females will choose a male that has a larger repertoire of, of musical notes. So if anyone's in the music, practice hard. Okay, uh, now this is an interesting one. I've always had a challenge with this one. Now these finches, we don't see every day, but we do see them occasionally, okay? We have the house finch and the purple finch. They share very similar territory. Um, they, they share very similar sizes. They're both sparrow size. Uh, and their ID features are very similar, but there's a couple that set them apart. So first, the house finch, you're gonna see a varying shades of red, even some yellow. The yellow's there because they're missing a, a certain, um, it's like the crotonids, they're missing this and, and their food and their diet. So they go yellow orange, but typically they're red. Red on the head and red on the breast, okay? The bill curves down and it's just a little smaller bill with a flat tail and they have distinct streaking on there. If you look at the picture of the house finch, very dis distinct streaking on it. Now you take that purple finch, it's almost like a raspberry color, head, 
back of the neck, chest, throat, underparts, feathers, it's all flushed through, but there's no streaking on it. Okay, house finch has heavy streaking, purple finch doesn't. And the bill is longer and thicker, breaking into the seeds, and the tail is actually notched. If you can get close enough to it or get a picture of it, you'll see that it's notched in the purple finch. The females of both these birds look identical to the males, just no color. They're, just, they're called drab, okay? So what I take away is this. House finch dipped in strawberry juice up to its chest, pulled out. Purple finch dipped in raspberry juice throughout the whole body. And that's how you can tell your house finch from your purple finch. Don't rely on the songs, they're, they're pretty close. Okay, moving along. And the occasional birds, ah, this, these are good ones here. So we put the swans in. They're all special in their own right. So we'll just dig right in with the mute swan. Mute swan, uh, I have her right here as a, I coded it as a green color because it's a bird you're gonna see every day. It is all through the Great Lakes and ponds around us, but it won't go any further than that. But they're down here on coastal bays, inlets, stuff like that. They're very comfortable in that, marshes. Um, one thing you know about the mute swan, it is an invasive species as well. It was brought over here by the British in the mid 1800s to populate zoos and backyards and parks. And it did what an animal do, it escaped and thrived just fine. So as you look at the mute swan, it has an orange bill with a black knob right there on that bill, okay? The males and females of the swan look identical. The only time you can tell them, a, you can tell them apart is when it's breeding season and that black knob on the male has swollen right up. Okay. Um, there's a phrase called monomorphism, and, and that's when two species of the two sexes of the same species are the same size. Usually we have dimorphism where the male is larger than the female. This is where waterfowl is typically the same size. This swan is terribly aggressive, so I'm sure some people who have encountered it realize they get some hissing from it. Um, and it'll show a display. Uh, the feathers get poofed up and it'll just kind of just wade back and forth very aggressively. It's a dabbler, so you'll see its butt in the air quite often, like some of the ducks you see, and dabbles for some of its vegetation. Okay. Uh, the mute swan, too, it, it, uh, Something about invasive species, I don't know, but it enjoys being around common reeds. So if anyone knows what Phragmites is, it's an invasive species that likes to, that thrives in disturbed areas. And not just that, it thrives in shorelines, ponds, any, really anywhere, it's very aggressive. And it's proven that this, these swans will nest in a patch of this because it's, it can uh, build a nest with the reeds, which are terribly strong and durable but it's gonna be far enough from the shore where um, the eggs are, are safe from predation. The trumpeter is a very special swan. Um, so trumpeter is actually our largest swan. It is a native swan to Canada, and it's just a bit larger than the mute. Mutes are very large. They're about 22 pounds, whereas this swan's about 23, 23 and a bit, maybe a bit more. Um, what you wanna do is, since they're both white and large, Look at the beaks. You got, for the trumpeter, it's a long neck that ends with a very long black sleek bill, okay? Um, trumpeters will grunt and hiss a bit. The, sorry, the mutes will grunt and hiss. The trumpeters will trumpet. It's this kind of nasal honking, like a trumpet, very softly. And if you see this bird trying to get off, off the shoreline, it needs up to 100 yards of space, of open water, just to get off, okay? So you'll see that quite often for trumpeter swans. Um, just like mute swans, uh, these birds pair up for life. If there's a death, usually they pair up with another bird, sometimes younger or old, or usually a younger bird than its, than its own age. Now a key for trumpeters, and they are in an area too, and they'll nest around here. You know, the same area, coastal inlets, um, bays, marshes, big marshes, but trumpeters, <clears throat> they, they, their survival is synonymous with, with beaver and muskrat survival. Um, their nesting grounds are typically 
on top of dams and beaver huts. Okay, so a couple of years ago when the trapping came through and trapping was quite popular, <coughs> um, they would trap muskrat and beaver out that had a negative impact on trumpeter swans. They didn't have anywhere to lay their nests. At the same time, trumpeter swans were being trapped out as well for their feathers, for quills, um, their skin for powder puffs, um, and to, for feathers for hats as well, to the point where they're almost extinct. And it was only because of a, an aggressive conservation plan that they actually came back, and they're doing quite well right now. And I just want to, I want to, Point one other thing, and I'm gonna um, allude to my classical background. The Latin name for a trumpeter swan is Cygnus uh, buccinator. A buccinator is a muscle we have in our cheeks, buccinator muscles. And if I blew a candle out, I'm using those buccinator muscles. So that's what they use. It means trumpeter. So this is the trumpeter swan and it has those muscles, so do we. But one step further, a bucanator plays a bucana. A bucana is a trumpet. So the Roman legions would typically employ bucanators to play bucanas, right? And the trumpets were used to signal um, uh, watch changes, enemy approaching, or maneuvers in combat. Always like throwing those in there from time to time. Uh, now, the tundra swan, the reason why I have it in red is because. It, it is our smallest swan, but it is our most common swan. But it's in red because it's more, it's a migratory bird around us. If we see it, it's because it's stopping over for a day or two to fill up, fuel up, and move on. Um, to ID these guys, they're much smaller. And you're going to look at the bill. And remember I mentioned that term lore, L-O-R-E-S? It has a little yellow lore just on the bill. You know, look for that, okay, if you do see them. A lot of these birds are tagged, big yellow tags being in their, in their wings, and they'll set them apart too compared to the mute swans. Uh, tundra swans do nest and breed up in the tundra. Uh, they'll nest right on the open ground, build a nest about eight inches off the ground, and they'll be close to little ponds. So they're constantly uh, on the defense from predators up there. Um, they're also known for their, as a whistling swan um, because of the, the, when the air goes through the feathers, it creates a whistling. Okay, so mute swans you're going to see more often, trumpeters, time to time, and tenders a little more rarely. Okay, these are exciting little birds. Actually, I saw 75 of these birds today. I was out birding. Um, they're just lovely. Uh, so we have the cedar waxwing and the bohemian waxwing. So kick it off right now. The cedar waxwing is native to our area. Bohemian typically only see in the winter time in our area, okay? Typically, they're more of a Western bird and then up, the, up north. Um, basic, how I tell these guys about because if you look at them, they look identical. They have the brown crest, brown plumage. Um, they have that, we call that waxy uh, colors at the end of the tips of the wings and their, and their tail feathers there. Overall, he was a little larger, but not by much. You couldn't really tell the difference side by side too much. The, how I do it, you want to look at what we call, it's a vent or the undertail coverts. So it's anything, just look at the tail and go right underneath it. On a cedar waxwing, it's all white. On a bohemian, it's this rufous brown color. And that's how you really tell them apart. Okay. These guys have very similar um, songs. It's like a, a very high pitched three, very short. And you'll and you say you have, I had 75 and it's just, all day long, three, 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 three. We call them earfuls. If you get a flock of cedar wax ones, they're called earfuls because you get an earful when they're singing. Um, they both eat berries. Um, the ones today I saw were eating juniper berries, the little blueberries on a juniper tree, and just having a feast. Two good, two cool facts about these guys, though. Um, they do eat a lot of berries. Sometimes the fruit they eat is a overripe, and they might get a little intoxicated. You might see them falling down, flipping around sometimes. Um, but these guys eat fruit all year round. And if anyone's familiar with a cow, uh, brown headed cowbird, um, they are parasitic birds, whereas they lay eggs in other nests of other birds. They'll lay one egg. They improve and they don't succeed well in the nests of cedar waxwings. The chicks can't survive off fruit the way chick cedar waxwings can. So, very cool facts about them. 
But remember, look at the vents, just under the tail, white for the cedar waxwing, rufous for the bohemian. Ah, okay. Actually, I had I saw a Cooper's hawk today too, and it had a uh, had a kill. I got some nice pictures of it. Um, these birds are extremely special birds. Um, very hard to find. I lucked out today. But it just it was just the right time, right place. That's all it was. Um, so we'll dig in with a sharp shin. These birds, they look. Let's look at them. Look identical. They look identical. But the sharp shins are small as a sipiter, and an sipiter is just a hawk. Uh, they're not that big. I've held them before. They're about robin size, maybe a bit bigger, between a robin and a crow, whereas the cooper is going to be just between a crow and maybe uh, a larger hawk, like a red-tailed hawk. The uh, sharp shin hawk will have a longer, have a long tail, shorter wings, long skinny legs. If you see it on a post, look for long skinny legs versus the legs that are more a little more stubby on a cooper's hawk. Um, sharp shin, the head on a sharp shin is small, very small and rounded, uh, versus a Cooper's hawk that might have a larger head that sometimes will look kind of flat, um, which hopefully will give it away sometimes. Their songs, hard to tell. They're, you know, that, that key, 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 it's hard to, I, I don't play songs at all with these guys because they're hard to tell. Um, but what I look for is their flap and glide styles. The sharp shin will do really deep, deep, deep flaps and glide, especially in open air. Deep, 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 and glide. Whereas the Cooper, it's very stiff beats. It'll glide as well, but you see more stiff beats and then glide. It's a larger bird, okay? Uh, both birds are quite comfortable in the bush. Sharp shins will be lower under the canopy whenever they're maneuvering through the trees and looking for prey. Coopers will go through the canopy. Uh, there's been studies found of Cooper's hawks with fractured wings and fractured chest of, of fatalities of these birds because they're smoking into uh, or hitting branches all the time. Um, they both eat very similar foods, songbirds. Cooper's will go a little larger. Um, Cooper's hawk has been known to be more common in town. And my wife and I are once sitting in our, in our, in our living room having a drink, just talking business, and the doves are eating a snack outside, and all of a sudden, bam, 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 on the window, it was two doves and a Cooper's hawk. And he nailed one of them and took it across the road and finished it off. Um, and you can see the picture right here, the size difference too. Cooper's are much bigger, much more aggressive but it doesn't take away how the question of the sharp shin as well. So size does make a difference for these guys. Okay, sharp shins are much smaller than the Coopers. Okay. Okay, red tail hawk. This is one of my favorite birds. Um, key ID, right off the hop, red tail hawk, red tail. You see that right there. That's a picture we took. Um, so there's about two or three of them there, and they were eating a roadkill. It was a raccoon. This was a few years ago. Uh, that was new to me. I never saw a hawk eating roadkill, but it was first time for everything. Um, so look for that red tail. If the hawk is soaring like you see in the other picture, you don't see a red tail. Not there. But what you're going to see, you're going to look for the belly right in the middle, and you'll see what it's called a belly band. It's heavily streaked. And if this bird is sitting on a telephone pole, you're going to see the same thing. It'd be all white belly with a heavily streaked right down, right in the middle. And that's definitive of red tail hawk. Okay. Um, the other definitive uh, definition of red tail hawk is that screaming screech. Like this, this song is definitive of a bird of prey. That it's like rrr, 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 rrr. really strong, piercing screeching. Um, if you ever watch a movie and you see a bald eagle soaring through the sky through a bunch of mountains. And all of a sudden you'll hear the rrr, 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 rrr. That's not, that's not even the same. Actually, the, the sound of an e eagle is not even impressive, half as impressive as that of a red tail hawk. Okay. So that screech, you hear that screech, one of a kind. Uh, red tails are perch hunters and they're hover hunters. Another word for that is called kiting. Just like you fly a kite, but the kite just hovers there in the wind, Red tail hawks are the same. They'll sit there and just flap, and then they'll swoop down. Northern Harriers, um, that's one of their favorite ways to hunt. Same with kestrels, American kestrels, they hunt that way, so kiting. Um, and if you're gonna look for these hawks and, and watch for them while you're out for a drive or for a walk, you can spot them while they're perched, while they're soaring, and while they're kettling. And kettling means when hawks, and all hawks do this, but red tails are they're well known for it. That's when they start circling. They've caught a draft, a warm draft, and they're circling up, up, 
up and then they're gone. Okay, so that's called kettling. Whenever these, whenever hawks like broadwing hawks and red-shouldered hawks migrate south for the winter, they'll do it in the thousands. And there's Hawk Mountain down, I think it's Pennsylvania. Like there'll be tens of thousands of birds, and they're all in one big kettle doing circles in the air. So it's quite impressive. So look for the red tail. If you can't see the red tail, look for that banding. There is a hawk right now that we, we can see. It's called. It's visiting us from the Arctic right now. It's called a rough leg hawk. It does not have red tail. It does not have a belly band, but it does look extremely similar to a red tail, same size. Uh, the underparts are a little darker, um, depending on the morph it's in, if it's a late morph. Um, so just be aware of that. That belly, uh, belly marking, that streaking there, look for that the most. Okay. And then we have the great horned owl. I have an affinity for owls. I enjoy watching owls and looking for them. Uh, so this is a great horn. These guys are considered the tigers of the sky. And if you know anything about tigers, they'll eat anything. These guys are no exception. They'll eat everything. They'll go after skunks, porcupines. They'll go after uh, frogs. Uh, they'll go after the cats, small dogs, anything. The, they are, nothing is an exception. They'll go after large birds of prey as well. Hawks are no exception. Uh, ospreys as well. So to tell these, these owls apart from other owls, because we do have a few other species in our area, look for the see that facial disc, see the eyes, the, those beautiful yellow glaring eyes. Around it is a cinnamon color, an almost orange tawny color. That's called a facial disc. What that does, it helps trap in sound, right? So we can pick out sound much more um, efficiently than, than other, other uh, birds of prey. Ear tufts, very, um, very prominent. Okay, there is another owl called a long-eared owl. Um, they're about maybe half the size of a great horn. They're not as big, but they do have very long ear tufts and, and their facial disc is round all the way around the head. Um, these owls, if you're lucky enough to see them during the day, that's amazing. What I would do, if you see a, a group of uh, crows called a murder, if you see them swooping and mobbing something in a tree, it's probably an owl. Good chances now. Go and check it out. I've been lucky many times that way. Okay. Now I have, I have here crows in the day and owls at night. These are nocturnal birds and they're feeding and they will get their, uh, their pound of flesh at nighttime. And I suppose the biggest way you're going to identify these birds, especially in the evening um, when they come out, is their song. The song, if you want to represented in just our language. It's who's awake, me too. Who's awake, me too. So hoo, 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 hoo. And you can sing back to them and they'll sing back to you. My daughter and I um, did it when we were, our family went for a hike uh, a few weeks ago. As we on dust, we were coming back to the car and there was a great one now and, and we were calling him and he was calling back. So they, uh, they are very territorial, so that's why they will call back if you want to try it. Um, these owls are extremely strong. They have about 28 pounds of claw pressure, so they can sever spines of the prey quite easily. Um, and those eyes you see right there, they're transfixed, transfixed into their skull. They don't move them around like we can do. Um, so they have to literally move their head like a turret up to 180 degrees around. Okay. Okay, so that, that's, those are our birds. Um, I hope some of that information resonates with you and you're able to use it uh, this weekend and, and forthwith. Uh, so now we'll jump into how to participate and enter your data into uh, ebird.org or birdcount.org. So ebird.org, you type it in, you bring it up, it asks you to create an account. That's what you wanna do, right? So you want to create an account. It's easy, it's free. All it does is send you an email, you activate it, and then you fill in your name, last name, and we go. If you don't want to put your address, don't bother putting your address down, it's not a problem, okay? And then all of a sudden, you'll see, uh, you'll see a menu, and then you can click that menu, and what you want to do is look for Explore Regions. Remember this, please, Explore Regions. Uh, the regions, and during the uh, Great Backyard Bird Count, 
you're either in a big city like Toronto or you're in counties like Simcoe. We are all in Simcoe, Simcoe, Simcoe County. So if you type it in, you will see me in there, Andrew Major, competing, blah, 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 blah. Or you'll see your friend or your family member in there too under Simcoe. So you want to type in Simcoe and they'll come up Simcoe, Ontario, Canada in the Explore Regions. And just refer that to every time. And once you're in there, you want to do a location on your map. Not that hard. Just got to type in where you were, whether it's your home, enter, and then you can put it on the map. Just put a little pin on the map and just put it's your home. Once you do that, it'll ask you some questions about were you driving, how were you, or were you stationary, or was it incidental? Easy, just click what you're doing and how long you did it for. Remember, you need minimum of 15 minutes to do it. And, and then, ask, then you just plug away a few questions there. And then you got your list, your bird list. Your bird list is going to be taxonomical. Um, you might be, have that feature to create an alphabetical order if that's easier for you. Um, but just be prepared. That's what it is. It's taxonomical. And so you put, say you found some snowy owls, you found two snowy owls, you can add details, say one was a male, one was a female, and you add a picture because pictures are fantastic. Throw some pictures in there, you go submit, it'll say, are you sure? You say yes, and you made your first submission. It's really not hard. And once you get the hang of it, it's really easy. Now that's if you want to use eBird.org. That's if you want to come home with your computer, you can do it. What you can do is you can download free apps called uh, Merlin and eBird. Merlin's great because you can ask questions, uh, or it'll ask you questions, you fill in answers, and it will tell you what bird they think you saw. Um, eBird is great because it's actually a checklist, and you can do it on the, on the fly. So you have your phone with you. If you have that uh, data for it, just use your eBird, and you can fill in the, uh, the checklist right there on the spot. Okay, and it will geolocate you right there. Um, really easy to do. And then you can, you can compare with your friends and, and you can see where other people are birding and, and say, oh, I got to go there. Maybe I'll see that owl. And, oh, I'll see, I'll see those snow bunting over there. You know, it, it's, it's a fantastic feature. And once you just get a little warmed up to it, easy. A lot of fun. And you, can, and you can do this all year round. You can go to this form and submit all year round, not just for these four days. Just You can do it all the time. Okay. Uh, so here's our, here's our common birds of Simple County checklist that we made up. We have about 80 birds in here, yet some are going to be moving through, some you might not see um, right away. Um, sometimes it'd be in the right spot to see one. Uh, but overall, these are the birds that I have seen are in our area in Simcoe. And I've kind of, I've put a frequently seen little um, diamond uh, bird feeder business that you could expect at your feeder. Okay, like the finches, chickadees, uh, nuthatches, blue jays, cardinals, right? Um, and I have, I have Arctic uh, visitors as well because we have all oh, seven or eight Arctic visitors right now. Um, snowy owls, northern shrikes, uh, we have common red pole, uh, red poles, here, uh, hoary red poles, we have um, lap long long spurs, uh, larks. Um, there's lots down here and they're all moving down because it's the way it's what doing the winter time. And this is downloadable from discoverclearview.ca. Okay. And please use it, print it off, and hopefully it will guide you with what you see. And I want to say a big thank you to everyone that has partaken in this and spent some of your time with us here. And hopefully you can take away some, some tidbits and some information some ID factors and ID keys to help you ID those tricky birds out there. Um, I want to thank Amanda and Clearview uh, for teaming up with us. Um, Echo and the Peak FM, 95 won the Peak. And I want to really thank my wife, Tanya. She has been incredibly supportive and helped do this from the start. Okay, thank you. And I'm, right now I'm going to put the host back to Amanda. One sec here. There we go. There we go. Right on.
Well, thank you so much, Andrew, uh, for this informative webinar on bird identification and to prepare us for the great backyard bird count this weekend. I just want to let everybody know on the webinar that we had 35 people participating from all across Clearview Township, as well as Simcoe County, across Ontario, and we even had a few people register from up north and even as far away as Calgary. So a huge um, attraction when it comes to bird watching and bird identification. I also just have to say what a great show of citizen engagement and it just demonstrates how much interest there is in creating um, education pieces to support our environment and to really demonstrate what is available out there literally in our own backyards, which is fantastic. I learned a couple things too, you know, I didn't know the difference in uh, bill sizes between Downey and Harry Woodpeckers. <laughs> I had a chance to see them uh, yesterday afternoon um, out at your place. So that was really fa fascinating. And um, just also, you know, how um, strong our environment it is in Simcoe County, being able to see all of those common birds, as well as a few of the rare ones that you mentioned, like what a great opportunity it will be this weekend. So um, like I had said, there were a few questions in the uh, chat feature. So thank you for people um, for participating. Uh, Cassandra asks, uh, you said the juncos put on more feathers in the winter. So when do they shed those feathers? Is there a particular time of year or a temperature? I wouldn't say, well, I, I'd say they're all based on when they start migrating back north again, because they migrate down. Young males will stay up north, and more females and older males will come down, and they'll put it on for the winter, those extra feathers. When they're getting in the breeding mode, all they want to do is breed, sing and breed. So they have no time for feathers. That's where you're probably going to drop the feathers right when then. And they're migrating back up north, so they're going to probably drop them. Less feathers, left, less weight to be carrying when they're flying up north. So springtime. Okay. Great. Um, I'm going to group these next two questions together. Margaret asks, uh, should bird feeders in your backyards have different types of food? I think they should, absolutely. Um, Niger food's great for finches, um, but finches will also go for sunflower seeds because they're high in oil and that fat content. Um, I use a lot of suet. Uh, I make suet logs, other suet logs. And so you can just, if you, easy peasy, buy some suet put in the microwave for about 25 seconds and you can fill those holes up, stick them aside and the woodpeckers go bananas for them. Even the uh, nut hatches like them a lot. So we have suet, a lot of um, the sunflowers are popular. Like you can get striped sunflower, or black sunflower, mix it with cracked corn. Um, you can buy it, yeah, mix it up. Definitely mix it up for them. Yeah, 100%. Do you have any tips to keep grackles away from our backyard feeders? Do you have a pool in your backyard too? <laughs> Uh, well, you can put a, you can put a, I guess those, those plastic owls out there, but grackles are pretty intelligent birds. They're going to get wise to it after a while. Um, if you have fruit in your backyard, putting a net around the fruit tree sometimes helps. Talk to my father-in-law. He might not agree with that one. Um, grackles are just very intelligent birds to begin with. So unless you have a pet sharp shin hawk, with you or something like that, really it's, it's a tough to keep them away. You know, they're doing what they're doing. They're the birds. Okay, good. And um, again, I'll group these last two questions together about snowy owls. Um, what's the best time of day to see snowy owls? Uh, Dennis writes in our area. So I'm assuming right here in uh, Clearview and in Simcoe County. Sure, so for me, when I go owling, I like watching snowies later in the afternoon. Um, maybe they're full. I don't know. I've seen them hunt, make kills, but I've been one in about two and a half hours. I've counted up to 15 owls and that was between about four, three, three to five, three, right when the sun started going down. Um, for me, you, you can go any time of the day you like, but for me, late afternoon usually works two, mm -hmm. three to, later on. And if you want some advice to go, um, rural roads are great because snowy owls, they're field birds, right? They're not bush birds like, like our, like a local ones. These guys come down from the tundra. They're used to open fields. That's what they want to be on. So you got to be in fields. Um, in around the Menacing Swamp is a fantastic spot to go. Open fields, lots of prey there. Okay. Fairgrounds Road is a very popular spot. Even 91, uh, 10th from Sunnydale to Brentwood. 
I've seen along there as well. Yeah, that's a great spot. I've definitely seen a snowy owl. I think the very first winter that I lived up in uh, Clearview, I definitely saw it right on Concession 10 on my yep. drive into Brentwood. So you can just see them perched right up on the top of those hydro poles. So it makes you want to do a second take every time. <laughs> exactly. Just make sure you drive really slow down those yeah. roads, right? We don't want to disrupt. Yeah. Uh, be safe. Get over. Get flow. over. Yeah. Right. Um, so uh, once again, thank you. There's some great feedback in the comments. Um, so thank you to everyone. Uh, fantastic presentation um, is what is being said. So uh, way to go, Andrew. Uh, just before we leave, I just also want to take this opportunity to thank our local media partners, 95.1 The Peak FM and The Cream Bar Echo for helping to spread the word, as well as um, our tourism uh, friends at Tourism Central County, South Georgian Bay Tourism and RTO7 for helping to spread the word through social media. All of the advertising and promotion that was done for the uh, Wild About Birding presentation was done through social media. And of course, it would not have been possible without the passion and dedicated time from Andrew and also from his wife, Tanya. So please join me in a virtual round of applause. Thank you so much. Uh, once again, tonight, you will be getting a wrap up email. So look for that in your inbox from myself. Um, it'll include the presentation and the link to our YouTube channel. And I hope everyone gets outside. Let's go out, enjoy those clear views of Clearview Township, and let's make the best of the great backyard bird count, whether it's right in your own backyard or at your bird feeders or at any of our local parks and trails nearby. Uh, this concludes the end of the Wild About Birding presentation, and I will stop the recording. So thank you again, and I hope you guys have a fantastic Family Day weekend. Thanks guys.